Thanks very much, Russell. And look, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure it is for me to have come from Brisbane to Perth for the launch of CEDA's Economic and Political Overview 2014. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of the uh, extraordinary panel of distinguished speakers that we've had here for our discussion today. I want to thank CEDA too for commissioning me to write the chapter on government productivity that is in um, the, the 2014 EPO and is the basis of my short presentation today. And in many ways I think it was a bold choice because as you'll have seen and heard from the bio, I'm a political scientist, not an economist. Uh, and if you get a chance to read the chapter, you'll see that it is very much concerned with the ways in which the always complex and often fraught intersection of politics, policy and administration uh, come together. And in, in offering the remarks that I have in the chapter and today, um, I just remark that it reflects my 25 years of experience of working in and with governments at all levels and more recently researching the Australian public sector at the national and subnational levels. I think CEDA's choice of a political scientist to write this chapter was apt, given that many of the barriers and impediments to improving the productivity and efficiency of government are, are political. Uh, the unfortunate tendency to deal in anecdote and stereotypes about the public sector often obscures this brutal fact. More attention, in my view, needs to be given to the political organisation and people dynamics that shape policy, uh, equality and effectiveness in the delivery of public service. And I argue towards the end of the paper uh, that we need to include ministers who govern the public sector and set its directions into these considerations. For 40 years, they've been strangely and conspicuously absent from debates about how the efficiency of government might be improved. Much of the contemporary debate uh, about Australia's productivity and competitiveness has focused understandably on the productivity of government. And my chapter in the EPO has two broad aims. These are first to provide an overview of efforts to address government productivity, recognising the public sector comprises a significant share of GDP and the governance and policy settings affect productivity in the broader economy. My second aim was to provide uh, some perspectives about some, I think, important dilemmas that will need to be confronted as we debate strategies uh, to lift or improve the productivity of government, whatever that might actually mean. Now, I say this because it's critical to ask what it really means when we talk about enhancing government productivity. Um, the productivity of government embraces both, on the one hand, policy and regulatory frameworks set by governments, and then on the other, government's role in an approach to the provision of public services. Now, the provision in respect of this first dimension, um, there's been extensive debate and there's a lot of work underway. Uh, Gary Banks, who'll be familiar to you as now the Dean of the Australia and New Zealand School of Government, but formerly with the Productivity Commission, describes three channels of government activity that influence firms and organisations. These are incentives, the extent to which the forces of competition ex impose external pressures and disciplines on business, driving innovation or creative destruction of less creative enterprises. Um, capabilities, those investments in human capital, knowledge systems, institutions and infrastructure uh, that enable firms and organisations to make productivity enhancing changes. And flexibility, ensuring that regulatory and policy settings don't inhibit efficiency or the ability to innovate. Now, Banks argues that incentives are a driver, while capabilities and flexibilities are enablers uh, of productivity improvement. It's the interaction of these three, he argues, that influences the motivation and ability of organisations to make necessary changes to enhance productivity. So I figured as a political scientist, there probably wasn't much I could add to that debate as it went on, and particularly given the economists are all over it. But I do think it's very important, and this is why it's the focus of my chapter, to talk about that second dimension, reforms to make uh, the public sector delivery across Australian jurisdictions more efficient and effective. And in the chapter, I look at what's going on in terms of directions and priorities for reform emerging from uh, the National Commission of Audit and comparable processes at the subnational level, the Council of Australian Governments and other review and inquiry processes initiated by the Abbott government. One of the key points I make in an early part of the chapter is that it's important to note that it's extraordinarily difficult to measure uh, public sector productivity. There's a robust debate around uh, between economists and academics about methodologies for measuring and assessing public sector productivity. In some areas it's very straightforward, but in others, and many areas of social policy that ARENA has been talking about, for instance, uh, it's much more difficult. This is because the outcomes are often intangible and because public sector providers operate within a framework of expectations and impediments, uh, and imperatives, sorry, quite different from those that apply to organisations in other sectors. 
And indeed, it's frequent policy shifts, constant restructuring and forces that I would uh, categorise under the broad uh, category of political that pose the greatest impediment to assessing productivity in the public sector, but also to enhancing it. And this is a very important point that I want to return to. I want to stress that my argument isn't that there isn't significant scope to improve the performance of public sector organisations. Indeed, I cite estimates of the economic benefits that could be gained uh, from even modest improvements in public sector efficiency. Rather, I'm arguing that we need to avoid simplistic and frequently loaded comparisons that downplay the forces that account for differences in relative performance between the sectors and which take us nowhere, really, in determining directions and priorities for improvement. I tend to concur with Ross Garno um, in his uh, book that people will have seen from 2013, Dog Days, that it's really the effectiveness of outcomes achieved from the investment of public funds that we should really be talking about. And I use in the chapter an example from education to suggest that innovation, adaptation and diffusion of practice improvements might be more salient measures um, in areas where government maintains a role in service provision. Now I mentioned that uh, a key aim of my chapter is to provide some perspectives on current um, efforts to reform public service delivery. And because I'm an academic, I'll say this, I'm frequently struck by the extent of forgetting in Australian public policy. Uh, the inability, or maybe it's the unwillingness to learn from past experience. This is an emerging area of my own research interest that I think has important implications for both dimensions of government productivity. And I have something brief to say about that in a later part of the chapter. For 40 years, the Australian public sector has undergone almost continuous reform and change. Um, New public management reforms of the 1980s and 1990s saw governments withdraw from many areas of provision where there were functioning private markets. Public sector organisations were exposed to competition or the threat of it, uh, and with the result that many areas of provision became more dynamic, innovative, responsive and efficient. But marketisation and contestability, the involvement of many different actors and interests in the delivery of public services, brought a range of unintended consequences also. It created problems of fragmentation and new challenges of coordination, consistency and sustainability. Now I discuss this at length in the chapter, but for our purposes today it's important to note that previous public sector reforms have helped to create systems of provision in most areas of service delivery that are mixed. The largest, health, education and transport, comprise complex and interdependent networks of private, public and not-for-profit providers. So a key issue then is what counts in analyses of government productivity? Where do we go looking for efficiencies and improvements? Clearly it can't only be in government agencies, yet that is where the majority of the focus um, goes. Another issue is how do we deal with the consequences, both intended and unintended, that can flow from interventions in one part of a system into other parts of a service delivery network. Now it's probably and especially an Australian trait, but most citizens don't much care uh, about the details of complex delivery change. When things go wrong, as inevitably they do in service delivery, they blame government, even when and perhaps if uh, services have been contracted out. And ministers everywhere have responded to the uh, existential threat of rude surprise by instituting systems of central control, endless briefings, uh, and accreting new layers of monitoring and reporting for fear of, and often in the wake of, a service delivery failure. This can have a range of negative consequences uh, for efficiency and effectiveness, for staff motivation, and for people's willingness to take the risks necessary for innovation and performance improvement. A system-wide change, as people from large complex organisations here will know, is hard uh, and rarely has it been immediately successful in a public sector whose direction is set by the constantly shifting priorities and concerns of politics. The time horizons are far longer than the tenure and electoral fortunes than even the most successful minister. Notions of success are strongly contested for philosophical and ideological as well as for substantive reasons. Results may be more visible at the individual service level than in the aggregate, given the many variables at play. So a potentially more fruitful approach to improving the quality and performance of public services then would be to trust the capacity and expertise of those at the front line and allow them to get on with their jobs free from excessive oversight, interference and constantly shifting goalposts. This approach indeed underpinned wide-ranging and successful public sector reform agendas in the 1980s and 1990s. But for reasons that have been well documented and indeed have been discussed several times today, more recent Australian governments have lost their reform zeal. Under relentless media scrutiny, ministers have become more reactive to criticisms and complaints, 
more willing themselves or through their staffers to intervene to fix problems, real or perceived. There have been sporadic reform efforts, high-level blueprints, usually initiated from the centre and focused at the system level. The capacity to implement them is often ignored. Some have disrupted rather than enhanced operations, subverting attention away from the efficacy and efficiency of service provision. And a corresponding thickening of monitoring and oversight processes has mired frontline personnel in red tape and compliance to the detriment of, of quality outcomes. Western Australians, of course, like Queenslanders, would be aware that a similar dynamic has evolved within Australia's federal arrangements, as the Commonwealth Government has expanded into areas traditionally the province of states and territories. So these developments highlight two related dilemmas that I discussed briefly in the chapter, but which, for reasons of time, I'll canvas only briefly here. The first is that would-be reformers often fail to apprehend the accumulated consequences of previous reform efforts. Because they themselves are often new, they treat public sector organisations as greenfield sites. So no institutional memory, a lot of organisational forgetting. The international experience suggests that frequent disruptive um, organisational change and policy instability undermine the capacity for efficiency and innovation in public sector delivery networks. And so too does the extraordinary loss of expertise and institutional memory that seems now to accompany changes of government uh, and sometimes changes of leader, I should say, in Australia. There's a lot more I can say about that uh, and I do in the chapter but I won't now in the interest of time. The chapter identifies the consistent themes that are arising from recent state-based efficiency reviews such as you had here and commissions of audit. These include reducing the size of the public service, refocusing on core services and responsibilities of government with government as facilitator and enabler of services but not necessarily responsible for delivery, devolving authority and accountability for decision making to the local level making areas of service delivery contestable and using competition and partnerships with private and not-for-profit sector providers to achieve quality services at lower cost, creating a more dynamic and innovative public se sector culture with greater customer focus, promoting workforce flexibility and more modern work practices, and better leadership and improved performance management systems. These directions present both a dilemma, but I think too an important opportunity. Uh, and examples from the health and education sectors suggest that micro-level reforms being pursued at the enterprise level may have greater potential to yield improvements in service quality and effectiveness than efforts to affect large-scale system reforms, which as I've argued are complex and are fraught with the risk of unintended consequences and implementation failure. In a 2012 speech, the Reserve Bank Governor Glenn Stevens described increasing productivity as a test of adaptability, every day doing a thousand things a bit better than yesterday. In the public sector, uh, improved efficiency and effectiveness will flow from increased adaptability in the provision of services. The challenge for governments then is to imagine service systems that unleash the potential for innovation, harnessing the energy, knowledge and networks of local providers to improve services, while also ensuring high standards and accountability and appropriate risk management. And can I ask then that they let them get on with it and leave them alone without changing it uh, for a long period of time? I think that would make a big difference in terms of efficiency and productivity. Now, coalition governments at Commonwealth state and territory levels claim to support devolving decision-making authority, fostering competition, diversity and choice in public service delivery. But as I argue in the chapter, empowering experience and devolving power and resources away from central control um, represents a major challenge to politicians, political advisers and other policy elites. A group my Griffith University colleague, Professor Gary Sturgis, has provocatively described as the policy class. Successful implementation will require a change in their attitudes and habits, and particularly at the federal level. It re will require the policy class to take risks and to hold their political nerve. They'll have to find ways of reconciling some very difficult tensions between hierarchy, which is what we're ac accustomed to in Westminster systems of accountability and networks, which is the right way things really work now, between autonomy at the front line and the, the drive to central control. And I think very contentiously between public expectations of universality and consistency on the one hand and diversity and choice on the other. Now because delivery systems are mixed, the reform task is infinitely more complex than can be realised through arbitrary cuts to the public service as has been adopted in many jurisdictions ahead of more deliberative efforts. It requires collective commitment and an informed public debate about the role of government and the services that the public is willing to pay for. 
Now, adversarial politics and the culture of entitlement that we hear so much about may yet prove the greatest impediment to lifting the quality and effectiveness of government. It's often remarked that Australia manages adversity far better than it handles uh, prosperity. But there may be opportunity in the fact that the governments who determine the next phase of reform are those with the greatest stores of political capital, with significant electoral majorities, and who in many jurisdictions, including mine, face very depleted oppositions. Many in the business community, Mike Smith again today, and others, including CEDA in its 2013 Setting Public Policy report, have noted the importance of good policy processes and government routines in designing, implementing, sequencing, and importantly, in selling productivity enhancing reforms to the Australian public. Those matters, like initiatives that would genuinely enhance the productivity of government, sit squarely in the, the court of ministers and their advisers. And I think that's a pretty consistent theme running through the day. Thank you. Thank you.